Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another Hard Count Podcast. Today, I'm going to be going over some guys, some running backs that you should not be drafting in your fantasy drafts this year. And I've got four guys for you guys today. Let's get right into it with my first guy, and that is Aaron Jones. I love Aaron Jones. He's one of my favorite running backs in the league, so I hate to put him on this list. But definitely a guy that I'm trying to stay away from in 2020. Um, currently be, being drafted as the RB13 going in the early mid second round. You can get him as uh, uh, RB2 or maybe your RB1 as well. But Aaron Jones concerns me for multiple reasons. First one, Aaron Jones only played 61% of the team snaps last season. And I think this came with a lot of boom bust weeks for Aaron Jones. And that's concerning to me, some inconsistencies in that department. And also Jamal Williams another guy on that roster that was taking a lot of carries touches away from Aaron Jones last season if we take a look at it Aaron Jones ended the season 236 carries Jamal Williams ended the season with 107 carries Aaron Jones ended the season with 65 receptions Jamal Williams ended the season with 45 receptions Aaron Jones finished the season with 44 red zone touches and Jamal Williams finished the season with 20 red zone touches now those numbers tell us that Jones was the clear number one last year But I think many of the guys in a similar area that are going in a similar area in your drafts as Jones do not have guys taking that much production from them week to week. And because if you look at it, 40, you're taking 20 red zone touches, 107 carries and 45 receptions from Aaron Jones, which is a lot. And again, a lot of the guys around that area, like Kenyon Drake, do not have those other guys as much. They're going to be taking that consistent production away. Another interesting thing with these Jamal Williams snaps was that we look at it and those numbers were about double um, what Jamal Williams was putting up. Aaron Jones was putting about double what Jamal Williams was putting up, but it it actually shows that Aaron Jones finished with up to more than three times the touchdowns than Jamal Williams did. So those numbers don't line up and it's not proportionate. I don't think those touchdown numbers are going to be sustainable for Aaron Jones. Not only do they have Jamal Williams in that backfield, they also added A.J. Dillon in the draft. This pick did confuse me a little bit, but we can't ignore it. And again, I don't think he's going to be heavily, heavily utilized in this offense. My concern is that even if A.J. Dillon takes a little bit of where Aaron Jones excels and where he really succeeds in fantasy, it could really uh, make Aaron Jones' fantasy production take a hit. And where Aaron Jones is successful, red zone is in the red zone. And... AJ Dillon, I think, would be a guy that you'd play in the red zone as well. Uh, more of a power back. Um, I think, again, we were talking about 61% snap rate, which when you put AJ Dillon in the mix, it becomes a problem. Maybe if it drops to 53%, 54%, those 13 goal line carries might go down to six, and not six, eight, nine, ten which would make it very hard for Jones to consistently put up the big time numbers on such a limited amount of snaps and opportunities as opposed to last year where he was getting all of them. And so if you limit them even more with A.J. Dillon, just taking that slight piece of the pie can really, really uh, make his fantasy production take a hit. Another big concern I have with Aaron Jones, those reception numbers, I expect them to greatly, greatly decrease this season. Why is that? You may be asking, wondering, and I think, and we look at it, the only guy with a higher target share than Devontae Adams last season was Michael Thomas for their individual teams. And last season, Devontae Adams missed a full month of the season with uh, injury. And those targets have to go somewhere. Those, All of those targets that Devontae Adams was getting had to go somewhere. And they went to Aaron Jones. In the games where Devontae Adams was not playing, Aaron Jones averaged 5.6 receptions per game. On the other hand, in the games where Devontae Adams was playing, Aaron Jones averaged 2.25 receptions per game. Less than half of his receptions when Devontae Adams was not playing. And guess what? Devontae Adams is playing this year. That is a huge, big, big concern for me as well. um, Because those... Jones was often relying on Adams to be out to get those reception numbers up. And with with Adams on the field, the reception numbers were definitely down. And those were the weeks that he struggled a little bit more in fantasy. So Devontae Adams on the field here, 
His reception numbers are definitely going to take a hit from last year. Same with his receiving touchdown numbers, which came, all of them came when Devontae Adams was off of the field. So that is a big, big concern for me. Um, because, again, Devontae Adams will be on the field this year, and Aaron Jones is not taking those receptions from him. So Aaron Jones for me, a draft bust. He's got draft busts written all over him. Uh, have a drop in goal line carries, big drop in receptions. I would not be surprised if he dropped in efficiency as well. And I can't see myself taking him as my RB2 or safely taking him as my RB1 because I think there's way too much risk involved with that. There's many guys around him that I'd rather see. I'd rather you see, I'd rather see you take a guy like Kenyon Drake or Austin Eckler instead of Aaron Jones. Now, let's go to my next guy, and that is Mark Ingram. Mark Ingram, definitely a guy that I'm going to stay away from in fantasy this season, even though he's a one of my Ravens, I love him, but I don't love him fantasy-wise. And he's currently be dra- being drafted as the RB20 in standard drafts, RB24 in PPR drafts, which means he's being drafted as a mid-low-tier RB, RB2, which I can't pay that price for Mark Ingram at this point. Um, same with Aaron Jones. I just see fantasy bust written all over Mark Ingram for some similar reasons. Um, Mark Ingram, again, did have a great fantasy year last year, but that was, it was, I think it was completely absurd. And it was very much reliant on his 15 touchdowns, which he got last season, which was fourth in the NFL. And he had four, I mean, he had five receiving touchdowns in 2020, which was more than even Christian McCaffrey. Not sustainable numbers for Mark Ingram in that offense. So I can't, I can't see that being repeated at all. Last year, Gus Edwards, 133 carries. Mark Ingram got 201. Mark Ingram scores. But even though that 133 to 201 is not a huge, huge gap, Mark Ingram scored eight times the amount of touchdowns as Edwards. That is a complete outlier number. It shouldn't have happened. That was very, very weird to me. And yes, the Ravens would give the ball to Ingram more and more as they got closer to the goal line. But it was not nearly up to that point because um, those still are those numbers are still absurdly unproportional to what it actually should have been, considering how many touches they were giving Gus Edwards and he just wasn't scoring touchdowns and Mark Ingram somehow was getting all of them. So another concern for me, big concern, drafted J.K. Dobbins. I could see J.K. Dobbins really coming in, taking over that RB1 role by the end of the year. And so you're investing in an RB2, you're investing a fifth round pick in Mark Ingram, a guy that by the end of the year might not even be a guy that you can play in your fantasy leagues because of J.K. Dobbins. He's got injury risk. He's 30, I believe, at this point. So I'm not I'm not sold on that. But you bring in a guy like J.K. Dobbins, fresh legs, is going to take up even more of those carries than um, that Gus Edwards was already taking. So you're going to take some of that carry total, which was 201, which is already limited. And it was, uh, and his fantasy production was very reliant on touchdowns. You got to take some of that away, some of those touchdowns away. And I can't see myself using a fifth round pick on Mark Ingram. So, and again, looking at it, starting running back in the NFL was averaging only 13 carries per game and only eclipsed and only got more than 15 carries two times the entire season. And that number, again, will go down this season because of Dobbins. Many of those other running backs that you're going to be getting as an RB2, RB3 are going to have much more than 13 carries per game. And I think those carries could drop to 10, 8, 7 by the end of the year, maybe. So I think it's, I'm not investing this. Also, Lamar Jackson is going to take about uh, a lot of that red zone production as well. 27 red zone carries, 7 rushing t- touchdowns, a lot of work on the ground goes to Lamar Jackson. As we know, he was the leading rusher on that team last year. There's too many guys in that backfield for me to really think that he can succeed he is going to start out as the number one guy but how many of those touches are going to go to other guys a lot of uncertainty there um again not a knock on ingram's actual play i think he's a very solid running back and i think he will do good things in real life for the ravens but i know this is one of the best rushing attacks ever and it makes it very tempting to draft mark ingram but those carries are going to be split between four guys consistently and that makes it so you never know what you're getting from mark ingram and this is a guy with injury risk and a guy that you might not even be able to play at the end of the year with any faith so last thing i'd want you to do is draft a guy like ingram over some of the guys at similar adps who are 
the bona fide number one guys on their team, you know what you're getting week in, week out in terms of carries, in terms of receptions. And I see Ingram's as a guy that never has too much upside and is a very risky pick considering the addition of Dobbins to that offense. So yeah, that's why I have Mark Ingram on my list. Now let's move on to my third out of four guys, and that is Devin Singletary. So we've got Devin Singletary here, currently going off the board as RB25. And I think this draft price is a little inflated for Devin Singletary at the end of the year. Singletary was playing very well, did a great job in the flex for your team. In some of the most important weeks of the year, at the end of the season, he did maybe win you a couple games in those playoffs. But I think, again, that's inflating his draft capital a little too much for 2020. I'm not picking up Singletary, and here's why. There's a couple of red flags. One major red flag for me is Zach Moss being added to that offense. Zach Moss is going to replace what Frank Gore did last season. Um, And what happened was the Bills did not trust Devin Singletary in many, many situations. The situations that are very much the valuable carries. When it came to the goal line, inside the 5, inside the 10, the Bills really did not trust Devin Singletary. They, in those situations, gave the ball to Frank Gore. Um, That is a huge negative. Singletary ranked 42nd in total touchdowns among running backs, and I don't see that really improving too much because of how little they gave him the ball inside of the red zone. Frank Gore took a lot of the load inside the five and the 10. Again, Singletary ran the ball twice inside the five yard, the five yard line. Gore ran it 11 times inside the five. Singletary ran it three times inside of the 10 while Gore ran it 18 times inside of the 10. Singletary only had one goal line carry all year, just one. So As the Bills get closer and closer to the end zone, they seemingly trust Singletary less and less, and that's the opposite of what you want in a fantasy running back. Those touchdowns really make the difference. You can't be relying on yards every single week. It's just not not something you can do with a guy like this. Zach Moss drafted with similar draft capital to Devin Singletary. He is going to be the Frank Gore of this offense. Um... He'll be getting carries on third down, getting carries in the red zone. So that's a big red flag for me. Zach Moss, the addition there. Uh, He is going to play Frank Frank Gore's role last year, which really limited Devin Singletary's fantasy production. Um, Another red flag for me in this Bills offense is the fact that they added Stephon Diggs to their team. And I'm expecting two things to come of this. Maybe we will have a better offense. So that's one thing that you might, that is a positive maybe for Devin Singletary. But I'm expecting a slightly more pass heavy offense as we see across the NFL. The teams that have that bona fide number one guy that is going to get most of the targets and you know that he's going to be productive week to week. They seemingly pass a little bit more than the teams that don't have that number one guy. Um, That number one star guy um, like Diggs is. And oftentimes teams with a clear um, number one, like Diggs, Diggs is going to get a lot of those touchdown passes that may have gone to Singletary or Zach Moss or other guys on that team. So Diggs is going to be taking up a lot of the touchdowns, which again, we already know Singletary struggles with. So that's not a good thing at all. So here's the thing with Singletary. Some of the guys drafted around him might have similar opportunity numbers in terms of carries, receptions. But what really separates them in my my eyes is the value of those carries. Singletary is not going to be a guy getting that valuable red zone and goal line carries that are necessary to have consistent fantasy production. I look at guys that are going around Singletary, David Montgomery, Todd Gurley, all guys that I would much, much rather have than Singletary just because of the value of the carries and you don't know what you're getting week in, week out from Singletary. Next, we have... Marlon Mack. This is our last guy on the list. I don't have too much to say about Marlon Mack, but I definitely would not draft him. Big do not draft for me. So I think he's a guy that people are kind of getting caught up in the name. Marlon Mack and how he's a guy that could maybe finish as RB2, had RB1 upside every week because of the load that he was getting in Indianapolis. My concern is that that load, that those carries he's going to be getting are not going to be there this year in Indianapolis. Um, And I've heard some people say that He's going to be an RB1. When you draft Marlon Mack, you're getting an RB1 for the first month of the season. And I think this is completely untrue. Taylor is still going to play. Yes, 
Mac might come out getting a little bit more carries, but I think Taylor by the end of the year is going to be getting almost all of the carries. Superior guy in Jonathan Taylor coming into this offense, going to take over that RB1 role. Um, one of my favorite guys coming out of the draft. Um, and Mac has always struggled to stay healthy. I wouldn't be surprised. That was another issue for him this year, and that's not the case with Taylor. He, Taylor's always been able to show he's consistently been able to handle a big workload, and I think that's exactly what Indianapolis is looking to give him to do. So I expect Marlon Max role to diminish and diminish over the course of the year. The only, um, you know, and don't get me wrong, Marlon Mack was a solid, solid fantasy option last year because of the carries that he was getting. But when those numbers get cut in half, cut, get more or more than cut in half there's absolutely no way that marlon mack returns value as a high-end rb4 low-end rb3 and the only acceptable way that i can see you taking marlon mack is if he's a handcuff to taylor but right now he's not being drafted in that range where he's a handcuff he's being drafted in that range that he's being regularly put into the flex regularly you're starting him week to week you're considering starting marlon mack not a guy that you're just storing on your bench hoping that he will handcuff. So I don't have too much to say, but again, you bring in Jonathan Taylor, cut those carries in half. Um, you definitely are not going to get nearly as good of a fantasy season from Marlon Mack. I don't see him returning value at where he's currently being drafted. So do not draft Marlon Mack in fantasy this year. All right. Well, those are four guys that I definitely do not want, think you should be drafting this year. Four running backs you should not be drafting this year in fantasy. Thank you so much for listening. And yeah, peace.